This is the third of the three longest days of Jesus's life and ministry. My name is Mike Scan. I want to welcome you here from Epic Life Church. And you're joining us on this story that's never really been told, the full story of the life and death of Jesus Christ. We've seen him in uh, Sunday where we celebrated the Seder and Passover uh, meal with his disciples. And then Monday night when he was betrayed by Judas and Tuesday that went into Tuesday where he stood before the Sanhedrin and had to declare before uh, uh, the, the, the great high priest that he was truly the son of God. We've seen him being dragged over into uh, Pontius Pilate and being convicted of a crime that he never committed. I've had a lot of people ask me the question, why are you telling the story the way you're telling it? Well, I want to tell the story from the eyes of Hebrew and the real story of the Bible. You see, Jesus made a declaration that should cause us to think of the amazing story of what happened, which gives us the freedom and the life that we were created to live. That story is, Jesus says in Matthew 23, he said, just as it was with the days of Jonah, three days and three nights in the belly of the whale, so will it be the Son of Man will be in the grave. Well, how do you get three days from Friday to Sunday? That's usually typically in our church what we celebrate as Easter weekend or Resurrection weekend. The problem is you can't do it. It's mathematically impossible. And that's why we have decided to go back and look at the original story and see how the story was really told. The story never told from Monday to Tuesday and today Wednesday. Wednesday night is actually in the evening time in Hebrew. That's the actual time frame that they'll celebrate. Wednesday night to Thursday night is one night. Thursday night to Friday night is two nights. Friday night to Saturday night is three nights. And then Thursday morning, Friday morning, and Saturday morning are the mornings that Jesus would have been in the grave. But I digress. I'm a little bit ahead of our story today. But what, I want to, what we want to do is pick up where he was. We just left Jesus as Pontius Pilate heard the crowd yelling, crucify, crucify, crucify him. He had no other choice but to release Jesus to the Jewish people and to their wishes to crucify Jesus. The Roman soldiers now gather up Jesus from being beaten. He's got a crown of thorns pierced into his head. He is wrapped in a cloth of burlap sack that is irritating you know the cuts and the bruises that are upon his body many believe that he was beaten so bad that he was unrecognizable that even his mother didn't recognize him as he began this journey we pick him up they take him out of the city of jerusalem and he picks up the cross and begins this journey he runs into a man named Simon. He is no longer, Jesus is no longer able to carry this heavy wooden cross upon his back. Simon, therefore, only in town for Passover to celebrate, is commanded by the Roman guards and the Roman soldiers to pick up the cross. In fear for his life, thinking that he would be crucified, he begins to revolt and back up, but he's pushed by the Roman soldiers to do it anyways. He takes upon the cross of Jesus, and Jesus and Simon together begin their journey through Jerusalem to Golgotha. As we approach Golgotha, Simon in the lead with the cross that Jesus is about to bear, we approach there. They see Jesus, again, unrecognizable. They lay his hands and his feet down upon the cross on his back. As he's down there, one of the Roman soldiers comes and steps on his hand and takes the spike the nail that they'll drive through his center of his wrist. As they do this, you hear a clack, clack, clack. They do the same thing on the next hand. They bring his feet down to the end and they prop it up a little bit and they put his feet together and drive a longer stake all the way through. Flipping the cross over, they bend the nails over so that the victim on the cross will not be able to flip and fall. It's at that moment that everything that Jesus did, it's everything, it's the whole reason why Jesus came to this earth. It is in this moment that they place the cross in its hole and sets it upright. As the Romans are setting the cross in place and bracing it, one side is a, is a thief, on the other side is a thief. One 
cursing and screaming and hollering, let me down, I'm, I'm innocent, I'm innocent. The other one is in weeping and crying and asking for mercy. It's in that moment that the thieves look upon the cross, the first thief looking upon Jesus, that if you're so this, look at you, you're dying just like the rest of us. But one of the thieves, he represents you and me. He looks at Jesus and says, man, have mercy on me. Have mercy on me when we go into paradise and, or, or die or go, go to the Father. And Jesus looks upon him and said, this day you will see paradise. You see, we're all on one side of the cross. But every one of us, man, our sin, the weight of our sin is what put Jesus Christ on that cross. The rebellion against our Heavenly Father. Sin will always push us away from the Father. But Jesus stands in the middle, taking upon His back, His life, the shame and the regret of sin. It will be the first time in all creation where Jesus, as he's drowning in his own fluids in his lungs, you see, crucifying was about suffocation and suffocation of your own bodily fluids. And as Jesus is up there grasping for breath, he looks down and he sees the people mocking him, Roman soldiers shooting dice for his clothes. And it's then he looks down and says to the Father, Forgive them, for they know not what they do. Jesus' last minutes on this earth are so close. So close. And in this moment, it is the first time that God, or Jesus, the Son of God, who had this amazing relationship with the God of the universe, you hear the most powerful words ever spoken. Jesus, who spoke to his father daily. Matter of fact, on the very first day when he's about to, and when he was talking to the father, he's about to be betrayed. He's spending time with his father. What happens? The father from heaven sees the sin of the world on Jesus. And Jesus feels the punishment. Jesus utters these almost final words where he says to the father, why have you forsaken me? It is the first time that the God of the universe, because see, God is pure, he's full of light, he's full of truth, he's filled with love, and sin can contaminate heaven. So sin could not enter heaven. So sin had to come upon the back of Jesus. And when God the Father sees on Jesus our sin, God turns his back. Not on Jesus, but on the sin that's on him. And then finally, the earth begins to shake and quake. The temperature begins to drop. And as that happens, the curtain of the temple is ripped into, signifying to you and to me and all of us that we now have access to the Father without having to go through a priest. We can go on our own. Then the earth quakes. The sun is coming down. Jesus breathed his last breath. And in that moment, and for the next three days, heaven falls silent.